In talking about the murder in the last lecture, I just gave you a brief synopsis of the crime. The actual killing was really quite horrible, with Raskolnikov struggling to wrest a purse from the old pawnbroker's neck, finding a key to open a strong box, filling his pockets with the gold jewelry inside, and so on. There was also, of course, another aspect of the horror, at least from the point of view of the criminal, for the fact that there were people who came down the hall and uh, came to realize that somebody had locked himself in the room. Uh, Raskolnikov, in trying to get out of the room, had to take advantage of several incidents of good luck in order not to be uh, seen as he left, as he left the, the house. He ran down the stairs and there were people coming up the stairs. He managed to duck into a room that was being painted. And of course, these details came back later on to haunt him because uh, the painters realized later on that somebody had been in that room. As a matter of fact, something was even dropped. These details, plus the terrible knowledge of what he's just done, are things, of course, that go through the murderer's mind, go through Raskolnikov's mind over and over again after he gets back into his room. And we begin to get inside the mind of somebody who's committed such a terrible crime. Uh, the first thing he does, is, of course, is to try to hide the, the parts of his clothing that are covered with blood. Uh, then uh, uh, he falls down on the bed and uh, gets into a position that's almost a, a close to insanity. He ends up on the bed uh, pitifully clutching some socks together because he's afraid that these socks might have some spot of blood on them that might be seen. His friends come in, the, of course the, the landlady and the people living in the house report to some of his friends that he seems to be in a terrible condition. The two friends who come in, of course, become very important characters in the novel. One of them is Razumichin. In Russian the word Razum means uh, intelligence or rationality. Razumichin is the one who stands for a somewhat calmer rationality, a somewhat calmer kind of decency, and later on will be attracted to the sister of Raskolnikov, Dunya. He brings in a little bit later a man named Zamyotov, who is something of a psychologist who tries to deal with Raskolnikov, and they realize that something is prying on his mind. They can't understand. They think he's a sick man. And, of course, they notice that as soon as they start talking about the murder, which, of course, is, uh, has tremendous resonance now in the city of Petersburg, he gets terribly upset, so they realize they have to avoid talking about it with him. Of course, they have no idea that he would be involved in something like that. Furthermore, he, they know that his family is coming, he realizes that uh, his mother and his sister are coming to visit him in Petersburg, and of course he's terribly worried about the impression that he'll make on them, and he, he doesn't dare let them know uh, that he's been involved in such a terrible murder. This goes on and on and goes through the mind of Raskolnikov over and over again, almost as if there's some kind of a spike that's been put through his brain. And I must say that when you read the, this particular part of the novel in part two, you, you, the reader feels a little bit as if a spike has been put through his own brain as well. Uh, Dostoevsky is quite skilled at getting you to be involved in the madness and the irrationality of the scene. In the middle of all of this, all of a sudden, another character shows up uh, in Raskolnikov's room. This is Luzhin. As you may remember, uh, I explained to you that Luzhin means a mud puddle in Russian. Luzhin is the man who had decided to take advantage of Raskolnikov's sister, whom we call Dunya, when she had been accused of bad behavior on the estate of Svidrigailov. He realized that she was in a very bad position, and in, uh, particularly when her name was cleared, uh, he decided that he would propose marriage to her. He realized that she was an unusually strong and unusually attractive woman, and he thought his taking her up when she was, was very, very poor would mean that she would be completely under his control. As a matter of fact, he even made the statement, which was quoted in uh, the mother's letter, that uh, it's very good uh, to marry a woman who is poor because then she will appreciate what I give to her. Of course, he let the cat out of the bag there, explaining that he expected her to be totally subservient to him in the marriage. Raskolnikov is furious, of course, at Luzhin for taking advantage of the situation like this. Dunya is doing this partly because she believes that Luzhin, who is a lawyer in St. Petersburg, can help her brother in the early stages of the career after he finishes the university. And Raskolnikov is, is very angry that his sister would think of sacrificing herself for him. He wants to sacrifice himself for humanity. And of course, the, the fact that she might have the same kind of pride that he has is something that uh, gets him very upset. So uh, when uh, Luzhin comes in, hoping to kind of lord it over Raskolnikov as he hopes to lord her over his sister. He's quite shocked that Raskolnikov greets him with enormous rudeness, with enormous impoliteness, and even quotes to him uh, the statement that he got from the mother's letter. And of course, Luzhin is very angry. He feels he's been misinterpreted through this letter, and he says, I'm going to talk to your mother about this. And Raskolnikov says, if you mention my mother again, I'll throw you down the stairs. 
Razumikhin is quite shocked by this, that he would behave toward the fiancé of his own sister in such a rude way. He says, uh, Rodya, Rodya, calm down, try to, try to bring it. And of course, the more he tries to calm him down, the more angry uh, Raskolnikov comes. Finally, Dr. Zamyotov tries to tell Lushin, look, uh, uh, can't you see you're upsetting the man? This is, he's my patient. Uh, 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 kindly, try, tr try to get out of here as uh, gracefully as you possibly can. Lushin is deeply insulted. And of course, Raskolnikov has built up against himself an enemy uh, uh, that will try to do all kinds of nasty things to him. Meanwhile, Raskolnikov is waiting for the approach of his sister and his mother. And of course, this is a, a very difficult thing for him because he realizes they'll see him and they'll see what kind of a state he's in. Finally, Dostoevsky builds up the suspense. He's a marvelous master of suspense in these novels. He believes in suspense just as strongly as Tolstoy is against suspense. And suddenly, the family appears. And he tries very, very hard to be kind to them, not to give them the impression of the terrible state that he's in. And of course, they immediately notice that, what's this? He, he's acting as if this was some kind of an official meeting. Why is, our, why is my son, and in Dunya's case, my brother, uh, uh, behaving in such a formal, uh, uh, stiff, uh, un, uh, unflex, inflexible kind of way? Uh, they, they can't quite understand it. Uh, Razumikhin desperately tries to get them out of the room to try to explain to them that their brother has uh, obviously been attacked by some kind of sickness. Uh, they shouldn't uh, irritate him. Uh, eventually, they do go out of the room, and of course, by this time, Razumikhin is tremendously attracted by the beauty of Dunya, of Raskolnikov's sister. And on the one hand, he realizes that she's a woman who is uh, betrothed to another man, but he doesn't dare uh, act toward her in the way in uh, proposing some kind of love between them. On the other hand, he can't, he can't restrain himself, and of course, in the struggle, uh, he, 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 he turns out to be sort of clumsy like a bear. And the more clumsy like a bear he becomes, the more they realize that this is a very decent man. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful paradox. You would think that in meeting somebody, it would be good manners that would attract that other person to you. But in this particular case, the Razumikhin's uh, bear-like qualities, Razumikhin's uh, uh, inept and clumsy kind of qualities only endear him, to, only endear him more uh, to Dunya. And you realize that there will, a relationship will grow up between them in the novel in spite of the fact that she's betrothed to another man. In short, the whole situation around Raskolnikov is terribly upset. And of course, Dostoevsky is trying to get across to you what happens inside a person when that person is engaged in some kind of violence and some kind of terrible scheme. It turns out that the prosecuting attorney in Russia in, in those days, the person who investigated the crime and the one who prosecuted in the trial was one of the same person. So that the character of Porfiry Petrovich is a kind of a cross between an examining magistrate and a prosecuting attorney. Uh, the very name Porfiry, of course, implies something because Porfiry is purple in Greek. And of course, the idea of the purple, that is the, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, was somebody who was always born in the purple room and who always wore the purple. Uh, there's something royal, there is something majestic about Porfiry Petrovich. And Porfiry Petrovich, of course, is increasingly suspicious of Raskolnikov, and he tells his relative Razumikhin that he would like to talk to this young man. He finds him very interesting, a uh, very unusual case. There's nothing less that Raskolnikov would like to do than to encounter Porfiry Petrovich at this point, but he realizes that if he refuses, it would look very suspicious. So he agrees to go with uh, Razumikhin to meet Porfiry Petrovich. And of course, Dostoevsky gives you a marvelous scene of psychological torture. Porfiry Petrovich very quickly understands that there's something off with this man, that his behavior is very, very suspicious. And uh, Raskolnikov is bound and determined to appear before him as a totally normal man who in no sense could be possibly be guilty of the crime of which, as a matter of fact, he was very guilty. Uh, so, of course, he goes in uh, almost as uh, laughing as if he's making some kind of joke. Uh, and Porfiry Petrovich uh, responds to the bait and says, oh, well, I see you're a very happy man. That's very, very nice. He said, you know, I find you a tremendously interesting young man, Mr. Raskolnikov. Said, really? Why? He said, well, do you know that article of yours? I said, well, what article? What are you talking about? So, said, well, surely you must remember you wrote an article that was published. Raskolnikov did not even know that the article had been published. And, of course, in the article, he had evidently written that there are two classes of people in the world. There are ordinary people who are bound by ordinary rules of behavior and laws of 
uh, laws of the land, and then there are in, in, uh, occasionally there are born some people who are very, very special, people like Napoleon, people like Mohammed, who are entitled. Not only, they, they, not only do they take actions which are illegal, but they are entitled to take such actions because they bear such an, an enormously new idea and such an enormously different approach to the possibilities for humankind that they are entitled to step across any boundaries. They can commit murders, they can commit atrocities. Would Napoleon hesitate to take any action that he considered necessary in order for him to become emperor? Would Muhammad hesitate at taking any action to found a new religion to make people see uh, the universe in the way that he wanted them to see the universe. Such people were extraordinary people and they had extraordinary privileges. Uh, they could even commit crimes. Raskolnikov said, really? That article was published? He said, for goodness sake, young man, you don't seem to take care of your own affairs very well. Uh, they, they would give you money for this. Or you should go and, and uh, collect a fee for having been published. He said, I find this extraordinarily interesting. This is Porfiry Petrovich talking. I find this extraordinarily interesting. Now, um, uh, tell me a little bit more about these people. I is there a way of recognizing such people? Or is there perhaps an inscription on the forehead? Uh, are they perhaps built in a particular way? And of course Raskolnikov realizes that P Porfiry Petrovich's suspicions are getting closer and closer to him. He says, oh, nonsense. These days everybody considers himself a Napoleon. These days everybody considers himself an extraordinary per person. And Porfiry Petrovich says, uh, you wouldn't by any chance yourself perhaps uh, consider yourself a Napoleon. Uh, uh, Raskolnikov realizes that it's getting very close. Oh, nonsense. Uh, uh, and even if I did consider myself such a person, I certainly wouldn't tell you. Now, of course, stop to think for a moment about this theory that Raskolnikov has propounded. Think of it in terms of the 20th century. As he has killed a woman who he considers less than human, a kind of insect, a kind of a louse. Think of the dictators of the 20th century who were responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people because they considered them somehow less than human, somehow not uh, part of the human race. Think of the foresight of what Dostoevsky is seeing here, uh, the future history of the 20th century. Uh, this is a very powerful and a very troubling part of the novel. Raskolnikov realizes that he's in big trouble with the law and with Porfiry Petrovich, and he's going to have to be very, very clever to escape the suspicions of Porfiry. If he was in bad shape when we saw him at the beginning of part two after the murder, he's in much, much worse shape now. And of course, Dostoevsky builds up all kinds of incidents together with Porfiry Petrovich and all kinds of conversations which only build the tension of the novel. If there's anything that Dostoevsky is brilliant at, it's increasing tension when you think it's gotten to such a point it couldn't possibly get even worse. He makes it worse. And Raskolnikov, of course, is a victim. You understand, of course, that he's been a criminal, that he's uh, exercised a murder on somebody who is his victim, but he, in turn, has also made himself a victim. Uh, there, there's, there's no victim who is in more suffering in this novel than Raskolnikov himself. Although uh, one thinks, of course, that he's trying to reduce an old woman to the category of a louse or an insect. That's also a terrible kind of suffering. In any case, he mulls over this. He gets involved in situations which only get him in more and more hot water. He goes back to visit the scene of the crime, and he meets a person who even calls him to his face a murderer. Uh, when he's at the height of tension and the height of guilt and the height of worry, uh, he suddenly falls onto his bed in his room, and all of a sudden he sees the old woman before him, and he takes the axe, and he hits her over the head again and again and again. And the more he hits her, the more she laughs the less she goes down. We suddenly realize, uh, Dostoevsky, in the beginning of the description of the scene, you think that this is actually happening, and it takes a while for you to realize that you're once again in a nightmare of, this, of uh, Raskolnikov. And of course, sometimes it's very, very difficult to distinguish when it's a dream and when it's true. He makes you realize exactly what it feels like to go through a terrible dream. He's a past master at that kind of thing. And so he's hitting this old woman again and again and again over the head. He's beginning to sweat. He's getting desperate. He's getting anxious. And the more he strikes, the more she laughs at him. And suddenly, through this dream, it's as if he's almost half awake. You know, when sometimes when you get, you're having a nightmare, you get to the most terrible kind of part of the nightmare, you suddenly want to wake up, you struggle to wake up. Sometimes you can't, you can't wake up, and sometimes suddenly you do wake up. Here he is struggling to wake up, and he's aware vaguely that there's some presence in the room. 